skills. Um, we will now move on to our next presentation in the interest of time. It is my privilege to introduce Dr. Hiran Patel. Dr. Patel is a bioequivalence assessor within the division of bioequivalence two within Office of Genetic Drugs. Prior to joining um, FDA, he earned his master's and his PhD with specialization in pharmacokinetics at the Long Island University in Brooklyn, New York. At the FDA, he is responsible for assessing bioequivalence of various dosage forms of genetic drugs. He is also the lead for topical and transdermal drug products and advanced techniques for demonstrating bioequivalence for complex products within the Office of Bioequivalence. He is the co-chair for the Bioequivalence Standards for Topicals Expert Committee within OGD. He actively serves as a consultant in research initiatives with, within the scope of the Gadufa Regulatory Science Research Program for topical and transdermal products. And Dr. Patel is also actively involved in um, reviewing product-specific guidances for generic topical products. With that, please uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Patel for his presentation. Good morning, everyone. I would like to thank Dr. Kose for the nice introduction. Now, I'm going to talk about practical consideration related to in vitro permeation test studies for topical products submitted in ANDAs. Before going into the detail of my presentation, I have the following disclaimer. This presentation reflects my views and should not be construed to represent FDA's views or policies. As we all know, the methods to establish bioequivalence for topical products are categorized in two ways. Traditional method, which includes in view of pharmacokinetic, pharmacodynamic, and clinical endpoint studies. And the alternative methods, for example, in vitro characterization-based approaches, which typically include no difference criterion, comparative Q3, IVRT, and IVPD, also in combination with in vivo PK endpoint study. As we had two previous sessions focusing on no difference Q3 and IVRT, I'm going to talk about IVPT in my presentation. I will start with IVPT method development parameters. Equipment termed as apparatus in the trap PSG of a cyclovir cream include a vertical diffusion cell or flow through cell. In terms of the dose amount, the trap PSC of a cyclovir cream has listed a range of finite dose that is 5 to 15 mg per centimeter square. If needed, the applicant may select the dose outside the range of 5 to 15 mg per centimeter square with adequate justification and supporting data in case there are challenges with the recommended target dose. Stirring rate can often be standard. In terms of sampling amount, the larger sampling volume may reduce error and apparently negative flux in certain region. During the method development, an attempt should be made in a way that the selected sampling schedule and duration should include a complete flux profile to include the maximum flux and decline in the flux at subsequent time points. As I'll be talking about receptor solution and skin barrier integrity testing in the later slide, I'm not going in a detail for the same now. The source of the skin is typically the cadaver skin or surgically harvested skin from posterior or abdominal region as an anatomical site of patients. Most of the time, dermatone skin is used. Let's get the basic understanding of the skin barrier integrity testing. The purpose of this testing is to identify the skin section with compromised barrier integrity which can be excluded from dosing. It may not correlate the permeation of most topically applied drug products. It is important to know that the technical procedures should not irreversibly alter the skin barrier. For example, if the taste involves hydrating the stratum corneum, sufficient time is afforded for the stratum corneum to return to a normal state of hydration before dosing. Let's have a look at the ways to conduct the skin barrier integrity testing. I have schematic representation of three ways of conducting the skin barrier integrity testing. The first one is the trans epidermal water loss, that is TWL, for which the results are reported as gram per meter square per hour since it measures the rate at which the water passively evaporates through the skin. 
The second one is triated water for which the results are reported as permeated amount of triated water per skin area. The third one is transepidermal electrical resistant testing which measures the resistance, conductance or related electrical concept that characterize the bulk flow of electrical current across the skin. In the interest of time, I'm not going in further detail at this time. However, I would like to get you basic idea about the acceptance criteria. Acceptance criterion is a predefined inclusion or exclusion cutoff to either pass or fail the test. Please note that the test procedure, skin type and preparation may have impact on the distribution of results derived from multiple donors and replicate. Therefore, it should be taken into consideration. In other words, if those conditions are not the same, then it should be developed and validated. Ultimately, the acceptance criterion should discriminate skin section with normal barrier integrity from those with a compromised barrier integrity. This should be verified by assessing the ability of barrier integrity test to correctly identify skin sections with a deliberately compromised skin barrier. I'm going to touch base on important parameter for method validation individually in the upcoming slide. To begin with, receptor solution qualification. The composition and pH of the receptor solution should be qualified in relation to the stability and solubility of active moiety in the receptor solution along with the use of antimicrobial agents such as around 0.1% sodium azide or 0.01% xanthamycin sulfate to mitigate the potential bacterial decomposition of the dermis and epidermis. For hydrophobic drugs, solubility of active moiety is always a challenge in physiological buffer-based aqueous receptor solution. It may be appropriate to use 0.1 to 0.2% polyoxyethylene only ether in the receptor solution to enhance solubility of hydrophobic drugs. I would like to make a note that the use of organic solvent and alcohols in the receptor solution to enhance solubility of active moiety are discouraged as it may have a potential to alter the skin barrier function and ultimately alter the permeability of the skin. This may potentially result in making the IVPT method unacceptable. Let's move on to the foundation of the IVPT method, validation. The discriminatory ability of the IVPT method may be described using two concepts, sensitivity and selectivity. Before I move forward with individual parameters, I would like to provide brief background about these studies. The IVPT sensitivity studies are typically performed towards the end of the IVPT method development phase and a key purpose of this study is to incorporate the final IVPT method parameters like target dose amount, dose duration and study duration to be used in the IVPT method validation and pivotal study. In short, the IVPT sensitivity study can support a demonstration of the validity of the final IVPT method. In terms of IVPT selectivity or pilot study, it should be performed once the IVPT method parameters are established. In other words, the expectation is that not only the IVPT method parameters but also the other experimental condition of the IVPT pilot and pivotal study should be the same as the IVPT sensitivity study. The IVPT pilot study typically supports multiple IVPT method validation parameters. Let's look at the consideration individually. We'll begin with IVPT sensitivity. IVPT sensitivity is the ability of the IVPT method to detect changes in the cutaneous pharmacokinetics of a drug as a function of difference in drug delivery. To further simplify, the IVPT method may be considered sensitive if it consistently demonstrates higher and lower flux profiles in response to increase and decrease drug delivery respectively. I would like to make a note that the difference in the IVPT permeation profiles are not expected to specifically proportional to the difference in the dose amount, 
dose duration or the product strength. I am going to explain further about these approaches in next few slides with some example to provide more clarity. We will begin with the modulation of dose amount. Modulation of dose amount approach is more suitable for topical products that contain volatile components which evaporates from the formulation following the dose application to the skin. So how it works? Most of the volatile component from a thinner dose, for example, lower dose amount compared to the target dose amount, tend to evaporate more rapidly compared to a thicker dose, for example, higher dose amount compared to the target dose amount. A thinner dose will tend to deliver less drug into the skin or for a shorter duration compared to thicker dose. Modulating the dose amount may not necessarily produce apparent difference in drug delivery for topical products like petrolatum-based ointment or other types of topical products that do not evaporate on the skin. Some products may not show dose-dependent difference in metamorphism which can alter the rate and extent of drug delivery. These are just conceptual example and each formulation has its unique properties which tend to affect the data. The bottom line is that the selection of approach should not be purely based on the type of dosage form. Let's look at some case studies. For the case study, the example shows the comparison of flux profiles for lower dose amount that is yellow colored, target dose amount that is blue colored and a higher dose amount that is green colored to assess the IVPT sensitivity. Please note that the analysis of the results from this study is qualitative in nature. That means the current thinking is to compare this data for each donor individually by looking at the behavior of all replicate as we can see on the figure on the left along with the mean values with standard deviation per treatment within donor as shown in the figure on the right. As I mentioned earlier, the difference in the IVPT permeation profiles are not expected to be specifically proportional to the difference in the dose amount. However, based on the available data, the use of threefold difference in the dose amount may be considered as a good starting point. The take-home message here is that individual replicates as well as the mean profiles within donor should demonstrate discrimination in profiles to consider that the IVPT method is sensitive. Let's look at the another case study. In this case study, as we can see, the higher dose amount that is green in color appears to show discrimination compared to the target dose amount based on the mean profile within donor. However, there are few other observations in the profile which questions to conclusively call the IVPT method being sensitive. The first observation is that the mean flux profile of lower dose amount that is yellow in color is higher than the target dose amount that is blue in color. As I mentioned in the previous slide, the mean profile itself is not sufficient to draw the conclusion. Further looking into the individual replicate's behavior of each treatment within a donor, one of the replicate of higher dose amount shows substantial high flux profile compared to other replicates, while some of the higher dose amount replicate shows lower flux profiles compared to the target and lower dose amount. The apparent difference in mean profile between the target and higher dose amount is a reflection of only one replicate. These type of observations question the ability of IVPT method to identify the difference in the flux profiles and may result in unacceptability of the used IVPT method. In this case study, I have used one donor as an example. If you see similar observation for multiple donors, the IVPT method cannot be considered sensitive in totality. In the next slide, I will provide you one of the hypothetical example. This plot represents the comparison of flux profiles between higher and lower dose amounts compared to target dose amount. The solid line represents the mean values for each treatment and the shaded area represents the behavior of all replicates per treatment within donor. 
This is just a brief idea of what I explained in the previous slides. Again, this is just a hypothetical example with the Tmax around the same time for all the treatment which might not be the case for the actual IVPT data as you have seen in the previous slides. This may be due to the different rate of metamorphism as I mentioned earlier. Moving to the next approach that is modulation of dose duration. In this approach, the IVPT study with a control or fixed dose amount is applied for different dose duration, for example, 2 hours, 6 hours and 12 hours. Please note that the expectation is not to modulate the dose amount and dose duration together to support IVPT sensitivity. An important feature of the results from such an IVPT study is the duration of the initial phase of the permission profile when the flux is increasing at a rapid rate. In other words, if you see a biphasic pattern that is rapid rate followed by a slower but increasing pattern in an absorption or permeation phase, I would encourage to consider the selection of dose duration in the rapid rate region. In this regard, there are some consideration for the selection of dose duration. For the target dose duration, sensitivity of sample analytical method and or the label use of the topical products should be considered. For example, when the RLA label of product indicate that the topical product should be reapplied every 4 to 6 hours, this should be considered to select the target dose duration provided that there are supportive IVPT data. For the shortest dose duration, sensitivity of the sample analytical method and its ability to produce permeation profile that can be apparently discriminated from that produced by the target dose duration. I would like to make a note that the removal of the topical product dose from the skin surface can be challenging and often require its own method development and optimization. Like the applied dose may be removed with a series of cotton tip swabs with the initial swab being dry followed by motion with soap or water along with adequate sampling frequency. Let's look at the example. A hypothetical example of dose duration approach. It represents the competitive flux profile between the target dose duration of 6 hours, lower duration of 2 hours and higher duration of 12 hours. As I mentioned in the previous slide, the dose amount in the donor chamber remained constant across all dose duration. Therefore, there might be an overlapping in the absorption or permeation phase in certain region of the graph based on the selection of dose duration. The discrimination in the profile is apparent in the decline phase. As I mentioned earlier, the solid line represents the mean values for each treatment and the shaded area represents the behavior of all replicate for treatment within donor. The next approach is the modulation of product strength. Alter strength formulations are routinely used to validate the sensitivity, specificity and selectivity of an in vitro release test that is IVRT method. It may seem convenient to use the alter strength formulation in an attempt to demonstrate the sensitivity of IVPT method. Doing so may not produce the desired outcome. In general, the modulation of topical product strength to support, dem to support demonstration of IVPT sensitivity is not recommended because it may not consistently produce the expected increase or decrease in drug delivery. However, in certain situations, higher and lower strength formulation compared to the reference strength may be suitably increase and decrease the drug delivery and cutaneous pharmacokinetic relative to that from the reference strength topical product. Before I move forward with IVPT selectivity, I would like to take a moment and talk about the IVPT pilot study which supports multiple validation parameter. The IVPT pilot study is typically performed with skin section from multiple donors, for example, 4 to 6, with minimum 4 replicates per donor per treatment. It is conducted with 3 pair treatment that includes taste, 
reference and alter formulations. What do I mean by alter formulation is that it is a topical product or formulation that is known or designed to be different from the reference product. The result of the pilot study support different validation parameters like permeation profile and range, precision and reproducibility, and selectivity. The understanding about the variability from the pilot study results may be useful to estimate the number of donors and replicates needed to power the Piotr's IVPT study. Moving on to the IVPT selectivity. IVPT selectivity is the ability of the IVPT method to discriminate the cutaneous pharmacokinetics of a drug between products that exhibit difference in drug delivery. As I mentioned earlier, the IVPT pilot study is conducted parallelly using the taste, reference and the third topical product. It provides supportive evidence that the IVPT methodology is selective. To provide you with an example, the figure on the left represents flux profiles for, the, for a donor comparing all replicates of taste, reference and alter product formulations and the figure on the right represents the mean values with standard deviation per treatment within a donor. Here the taste product serves as a positive control and alter product serves as a negative control compared to the reference product. That means the taste and reference products should demonstrate equivalence while the alter products should demonstrate inequivalence compared to the reference product. I would like to make a note that the application of statistical analysis may not lead to a conclusive decision on acceptability of IVPT method selectivity. This, the reason for the same is that the IVPT pilot study is performed using four to six donors and due to inherent variability of the scheme and resultant IVPT data may not be sufficiently powered to conclude the same using the reference scale bioequivalence approach. Therefore, similar to the IVPT sensitivity data, it would be meaningful to compare this data for each donor individually by looking at the behavior of all replicates along with mean values with standard deviation per treatment. In this figure, the green color profile that is alter product shows lower permeation compared to the reference product that is in blue color. This observation was consistent across other donors utilized in the study. Therefore, the IVPT method was considered selective. The next part is the control study procedure. Throughout the presentation, I have used the term variability which you may be familiar associated with the nature of the skin. Therefore, it is very important to control study procedure, for example, consistent skin preparation, skin thickness, skin storage condition that includes the duration and number of freeze and pull cycle. As different anatomical sites may have a different permeability, it is better to use the same anatomical site for all donors for IVPT sensitivity, pilot and PO2 studies. With that, the consistent dosing procedure which include area, amount and techniques are very important. Difference in Differences in dosing techniques may alter the metamorphism of the doses form on the skin and inconsistencies in the diameter of the area dose on each diffusion cell may significantly influence the dosed area and contribute to error in the calculation of flux. To add more in this aspect, sampling techniques also plays a significant role and should be controlled as precisely as possible. As I mentioned earlier, pivotal studies should include a non-dose control skin section from each skin donor. It should be mounted in a diffusion cell and treated identically to the dose skin sections, including sampling of the receptor solution at all time points to ensure that the drug concentration monitored in the receptor solution are associated with the dose applied in the IVPT pivotal study and ensure that there is no drug contamination across the study duration. A pre-dose zero sample collected from each diffusion cell is also recommended 
which may identify potential contamination associated with each skin section and or each diffusion cell. With that, moving to the last part of my presentation, that is IVPT endpoints. Flux and total cumulative amount permeated into the receptor solution across the study duration, that is AMT. Please note that this was termed as AUC in the trap PSG of acyclovir cream. The flux profile should be plotted as the flux on the y-axis versus time on the x-axis and the maximum values for each diffusion cell provides the JMAS for the corresponding cell. The extent of drug permeation should be plotted as the total cumulative amount of drug permeated on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. Let's talk about the statistical analysis. Similar to the in vivo PK endpoint study, if SWR value of the reference product is greater or equal to 0.294, it is recommended to use reference scaled average bioequivalence approach. Otherwise, use the average PE approach for B determination. At the completion of the study, if the number of skin replicates are the same for all donors in the taste and reference topical product treatment groups in the IVPT study, use a balanced design statistical analysis. If the skin section or diffusion cells are excluded from the final statistical analysis because of experimental loss or issue and the resulting data set is unbalanced, use an unbalanced design statistical code. In this slide, I have further resources for your reference. With this, I would like to acknowledge my OB colleagues, Dr. Anil Nair, Dr. Tyana Vivian, Dr. Sajan Chiang, Dr. Hong Ling Zeng, Dr. Bing Lee, Dr. Partha Roy, and Bioculens Assessor, along with ORS colleagues, Dr. Ying Xiang, Dr. Tanaz Ramazanli, Dr. Priyanka Kos, Dr. Sam Rane. Last but not the least, I would like to thank all of you to patiently listen to my presentation. Back to you, Dr. Kos. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Patel, for the wonderful presentation. Uh, time to introduce the last panel for the day. So while I'm introducing our panelists, I would like to invite them to turn on their uh, webcams so we, we can begin the panel session shortly. Our first panelist today is Dr. Usha Katragarda. Dr. Katragarda is currently a staff fellow within the Division of Bioequivalence 3, Office of Bioequivalence, Office of Generic Drugs. Uh, Ms. Uh, Archana Manarekar, uh, she's a pharmacologist within the Division of Bioequivalence 1, Office of Bioequivalence, Office of Generic Drugs. We have Dr. Elena Rantu. She, she's a lead mathematical statistician joining us from uh, the Division of Biostatistics 8, Office of Biostatistics within the Office of Translational Sciences, Dr. Hiran Patel, and Dr. Sam Rani. Um, so I'd like to begin the panel session uh, while, okay, we have Archana joining us now, so we can, we are ready to start. So to start this panel, the first set of questions are for you, Hiran. Um, there was a question, uh, is it necessary to measure the skin temperature uh, at the surface of the skin um, at every, uh, routinely if one can demonstrate that the skin temperature is maintained within uh, 32 plus minus one degree centigrade by using a circulating water bath and maintaining the source at uh, 34 degree centigrade. In other words, is it mandatory to continue to measure the skin temperature at every single time point? Thank you for the question. So for the IVPT study, the recommendation is to have the non-dose cell along with the dose cell of the taste and reference products. Uh, and the recommendation is to measure the membrane surface temperature periodically uh, over, the, over the study duration because this study is typically, you know, 48 to 96 hours. And by measuring the membrane surface temperature of a non-dose cell, we want to make sure that over the study duration, there was not much 
deviation in the membrane surface temperature. So it is recommended to measure the membrane surface temperature periodically. Thank you. Would anybody else like to add? Thank you, Helen. Um, so this next question for you, Hiren, is um, do we need to hydrate the skin before dosing? So I was hoping you can speak a little bit to the recommended procedures for handling skin before dosing. So it, so I, maybe I, I would like to know, like, you know, what, what do you mean by the hydrate? So because for the IVRT study, soaking the synthetic membrane in a receptor solution is common but that is that should not be extrapolated to the to the ivpt study and we have seen in in multiple applications that the skin section was soaked or submerged in a receptor solution somewhere from 30 minutes to two hours which is not recommended so i would like to take this opportunity and you know uh, suggest or recommend that please avoid uh, the submerging or soaking the, the skin section in the, in the receptor solution prior to the dosing. With that being said, you know, a quickly rinse, like, you know, a couple of minutes of rinse to, to remove any, any particular matters from the skin section, it is okay to do that. And, you know, if you let it dry for like, you know, after a couple of minutes of exposure of water and dry it for 30 minutes, that should be sufficient uh so that's my my two cents on that one uh sam would you like to add anything on that one no i i think you've said it very nicely thank you Hiran and sam um the next question is for you archana uh, and the question is um how does one determine the acceptable criteria for uh, skin barrier integrity testing Hi, thank you. Um, so from a, a review, uh, uh, a BE assessor's perspective, uh, the sort of uh, data that we look for uh, in support of uh, your barrier integrity acceptance criterion is we see, uh, is there any literature evidence that you've provided to support um, the use of your acceptance criterion? If not, um, is there any empirical study uh, evidence that has been submitted. So, for example, have you looked at um, the the range of uh, barrier integrity levels uh, that would consider that for skin sections that you would consider have a competent barrier, and compared those with uh, other values for non-competent uh, skin sections. So, sort of, how have you come up with your uh, choice? of acceptance criteria for your selected uh, barrier integrity uh, testing. So I guess the, uh, the answer is uh, we need to see in your submission if you have uh, adequate evidence and data to support the uh, acceptance criteria that you've utilized uh, to in support or to demonstrate that your the skin sections that have been utilized in your validation and pivotal studies um, are in fact, uh, or have in fact, a competent barrier. Thank you. Thank you, Archana. Um, the next question is for Usha. Uh, the, and the question is, uh, is there a recommendation for how many minimum uh, number of donors should be used in the IVPT sensitivity study? Uh, it is recommended to perform uh, IVPT sensitivity study with multiple donors, like uh, four to six donors with a minimum of four replicates for each donor for the, the treatment group. Thank you. Thank you, Osha. Um, Sam, the next question is for you. Um, what kind of solubility modifiers are um, can be utilized in the receptor solution during an IVPT study. Uh, for example, is it okay to use BAS, BSA in the receptor solution to enhance solubility? Um, Hiran explained this very nicely during his presentation. Uh, and also in FDA guidance, we recommend 
um, a, uh, a solubility modifier, um, uh, you know, OLIS 20 or Volpo 20, um, that provides excellent solubility uh, for a large variety of uh, hydrophobic compounds with a range of log P's. Um, and it has the advantage that in very, very small quantities, it can provide more than adequate solubility without it impacting um, the sample uh, processing that would be needed afterward and without impacting the peak shape of, um, uh, of the analytical uh, method. Um, now, using something like BSA is, is, is also you know, acceptable. Um, and largely because one of the most important considerations of any solubility modifier is that it should not alter the barrier function of the skin itself. Um, and this is one of the concerns with most other solubility modifiers. I think BSA is perfectly reasonable to utilize, and I, you know, I'm not aware of evidence that BSA should uh, negatively impact the skin barrier. However, uh, I will say that sometimes that BSA can cause some um, challenges in, uh, in, in uh, you might have to clean up your analytical sample, um, but, uh, but hopefully that answers the question. We certainly do not recommend using uh, alcohols because they have the potential to alter the, the skin barrier. Uh, and if you deviate away from a, um, a solubility modifier like the one that is recommended in the guidance, then there would have to be uh, pretty compelling studies done to be able to characterize uh, what impact it has on the skin barrier. And that, that can be challenging, not impossible, but challenging. Thank you, Sam. Uh, one follow-up question, and this can go to the entire panel, but um, maybe, Sam, you can start. The question is, is it mandatory to do a complete uh, replacement of the receptor solution at each time point during an IVPT study, especially for drugs that do not have a solubility or stability issue? Or is it OK to do partial uh, sampling? removal when possible is because small aliquot sampling um, as like the kind that we actually recommend for an IVRT study we don't recommend that for an IVPT study precisely because um, when we've worked with multiple research groups different labs different parts of the world and also when we've seen andas submitted where people have utilized aliquot sampling for IVPT studies um, we see uh, difficult data that's very difficult to interpret uh, and very poor quality data. So rather than seeing, um, you know, nice, smooth um, profiles for the flux profile, they end up being very, you know, uh, uh, strange profiles where the rate has increased and the rate has decreased. And the rate has increased and the rate has decreased. Doesn't make a lot of sense. And sometimes you'd even see negative flux because, you know, uh, which makes no sense. It's as if the drug is coming into the skin, then the drug's leaving the skin, then it's coming back in, then it's leaving. This is very, you know, it's not sensible data. And part of this is an aberration, an experimental aberration that seems to be associated with errors that arise during sampling small aliquots of IVPT receptor solution, which contain very small amounts of drug to, be, to begin with. So, uh, when you have low amounts of drug coming through, um, while it is possible to do aliquot sampling, the recommendation would be make those aliquots as large as possible to reduce the error associated with that. And during method development, try to make sure that you're not seeing negative flux and that you're getting, you know, meaningful uh, kind of interpretable data. Thank you, Sam. Um, the next question we have is for you, Hiran. Um, for the IVPT sensitivity study, should that study be performed during method development or should it be done during method validation? So sensitivity and selectivity is a part of, you know, we don't want to dissociate the information. So yes, sensitivity and selectivity is a part of IVPT method validation. With that being said, uh, once 
the initial parameters are established uh, during the IVPT method development, there are certain aspects which need to be further finalized. For example, a dose amount, uh, study duration, dose duration. So those parameters should be finalized at the time of you know, method development and sensitivity can support those parameters. So even though it's a, it's a IVPT method validation parameters, sensitivity just finalize all those IVPT method parameters. And once those parameters are finalized by conducting the IVPT sensitivity study, then you go in an IVPT validation study and it is recommended not to change any parameters during the validation and pivotal study. And if that's the case, we may ask you to, to further support any changes in the and the validation parameters, including the, the skin sections or the anatomical side of the skins, because we have seen that sometimes you go in a in a validation or pivotal study and there's a change in the anatomical side, and there are no further data to support that the permeability across the anatomical site are the same. So uh, to answer this question, you know, sensitivity study is conducted during the as a part of method development to finalize the final, final IVPT method parameters. Thank you. Welcome. Would anybody else like to add? Okay. Um, next question is for you, Usha. Um, what products should be used during the method validation study? Um, the test product or the reference product? The answer is, yeah, for method validation, usually uh, for other kind of studies, we recommend a reference product. But however, for the IVPT studies, uh, the answer is both a test product and reference product. For example, in studies like for sensitivity study, uh, if they choose to use a different product strength, they have to alter the test formulation. Uh, and also for selectivity uh, study, they have to use the third topical product. The design of the formulation is different from the test and reference. So in that case, they have to alter the formulation. So uh, they have to design a different test formulation. How, uh, and also they can use a reference product with, uh, from different uh, uh, market or different design. So the answer is both test and reference product. Thank you. Thank you. Would anybody else like to add anything to that response? Okay. As I covered in the in the presentation for sensitivity and sorry, so for the altering the dose amount or dose duration, you are using the same drug product. It's just the amount is different or the, the export time is different. And for that, one can utilize the taste or reference product. Uh, in terms of the selectivity, we recommend to use the three product taste, reference, and alter. So uh, it should be okay to use taste or reference for the sensitivity, but there are always taste and reference for the selectivity. So I hope that's helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. Um, the next couple of questions are for you, Elena. Um, the first one is um, what are we, we have talked? before about outliers in IVPT studies. What are outliers? Is it appropriate to consider an outlying donor rather than just outlying replicates um, in, in an IVPT study? Thank you for the question. Um, it is, so when we have uh, IVPT studies because of uh, skin variability, we know that uh, the behavior of do different donors can vary. Uh, but if we have a good uh, generic product, then we do expect, even for a, a donor uh, that behaves differently than others, we do expect similar behavior uh, within that, set, that donor for the test and the reference product. So uh, definitely the, the distinct donor behavior is something that we do want to know, is knowledge that we do not want to throw. Uh, and for that reason, we cannot uh, it is not correct to consider an outlying donor. However, within one donor, we may have um, replicate skin sections that behave um, so in extreme, um, extreme values or uh, a behavior which is different than the rest of the replicate sections uh, in that donor. So it is correct to consider 
at um, outlying replicates uh, rather than outlying donors. Thank you, Elena. Would mm -hmm. anybody like to add to that question? I'll just note that while, uh, sorry, Sam, go ahead, please. I think I would just emphasize on that is that um, the the comparison of a product is done within a donor's here. The test versus reference um, profiles may well be different from one donor to another. And um, one donor or a set of donors in that population may have much higher or much lower permeability than others. That's just the nature of what we see in the human population. Uh, so that's not um, errant, you know, aberrant information. That's real information. What we care about is how the test and the reference product compare in every donor, whether it's a high permeating donor or a low permeating donor. And so all of that information is appropriate to retain in the data set. And so in that sense, you would not typically consider a, a donor to be an outlier just because its permeability is different than the other donors. Uh, if now, for some reason, you're just getting you know garbage data, uh, uninterpretable data through the through the donor, all the donor skins are failing barrier integrity tests. You know that's a separate issue. Um, but then those donors, because they all failed the barrier integrity test, shouldn't even be in the in the study in the first place. Thank you, Sam. I'll just add that uh, at this time. Um, our recommendation is that the only situation where it may be possible to justify an outlier is the, if there are documented experimental um, errors that happened with a specific cell. Uh, it may not be appropriate to remove a cell, uh, remove data just because uh, there are aberrant shapes that are observed in the profile. So this is something that we have discussed before and is um, the recordings for that talk are cited in Hiran's presentation. Um, another question for you, Elena. Um, how should values below the limit of quantification be handled? This is a good question. Um, I don't know if there is a definite answer <laughs> for that question. Uh, however, from a statistical perspective, um, the way we see it is that we have a very low value um, and we need to uh, to handle this value in such a way that um, we keep that information of having a very low value. So somehow we need to uh, overcome the computational uh, deficiency, the computational barrier that we will face if we have to um, if we have to log transform a value which is very close to zero. Uh, however, there should be a way for us to, um, to handle this uh, and still uh, keep the information that we had the low value there, but we still uh, be able to keep that value and use it to uh, use it for our calculations. Thank you, Elena. And uh, one note is if you have suggestions or recommendations that you are proposing to use in your prospective ANDA, please feel free to reach out using um, either the pre-NDA pathway or the control correspondence pathway to, to resolve such questions before, the, before you actually submit the ANDA. Um, next question for you, Hiran. Um, if we are getting maximum concentration or I think J max at the first time point, um, how do we optimize or what are your recommendations for optimizing the method further so that that, that doesn't happen? Next is, is a distinct from the in vivo study. So when we talk about the in vivo study, you know, we are we are the expectation is we are trying to catch a nice absorption phase here the the first time point being a highest you know being a gmx do not represent the concentration at that particular time this is a rate over the that sampling interval and 
you know, in terms of the sampling interval, it really depends what is your first sampling time point. Is it like your first sampling time point is 24 hours and you see the first time point being a JMAX, then, you know, it's worthwhile, you know, taking more sample at earlier time point. Now, if you are conducting a first sample at the one or two hours and you start seeing the, it's a JMAX, the expectation is not we, the expectation is not like, you know, you take sampling at five minutes because that sometimes is not even a practical for the IEPT study. So if you see one or two hours and that being a JMAX, that's not a concern. But, you know, if you are having a 24 hour as a first sampling time point, then we definitely ask you to, you know, capture more accurate JMAX. So having more frequent sampling at earlier time point, you know, that will be helpful. But one should figure out this all this part during the method development. Now, with that being said, you know, I think method development is conducted using very limited number of donors. So let's say I'm developing a method and things work out nice. And the moment I go in a uh, pilot study or pivotal study, there are always one or two donors which gives you the JMAX, but that should be fine as long as there are adequate efforts made to develop a method. Uh, and, you know, majority of the donors shows, you know, gym, nice, you know, nice, uh, uh, capture of the, of the permeation phase in terms of the JMAX, uh, it should be fine. I hope that answers the question. Uh, anybody would like to add anything else, Sam? Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, Sam, two questions for you. Um, one is, can heat-separated epidermis be used um, instead of uh, full thickness skin? And then uh, a second question is, um, should uh, barrier integrity test be done at the beginning of the experiment or at the end? Um, uh, to separate, to heat separate the epidermis. Um, and it's a more fragile membrane that is more um, susceptible to, uh, to different types of failure. Um, whereas uh, dermatomed skin um, you know, is, is a more reliable uh, membrane to, to work with. However, uh, if the heat separated epidermis is utilized, um, it, uh, the recommendation would be uh, to again not overhydrate the skin and the the process, um, and that um, uh, that uh, you know it can even be put in a Ziploc bag, um, and um, uh, as you know during processing, uh, there's some some technical considerations that that come into play. The other part is you want to make sure the barrier integrity, of course, is is good, and I think that ties into the second question. Uh, so the barrier integrity test makes a lot of sense to do before the skin is dosed with the product because you're assessing the intactness of the skin itself. It's kind of a competence uh, to be uh, uh, a test system uh, for evaluating um, the rate and extent to which the drug permeates through the skin from the test and reference product. But many products actually contain ingredients that can then alter the skin barrier. So it can be a little bit difficult to interpret the results of a barrier integrity test on a piece of skin that has already been dosed with product at, and then to kind of look at that barrier integrity at the end. So while it is feasible to do and it is possible to get information from that, um, it can be difficult to interpret that, those results um, and uh, you know, I'm not saying that there are not times when it, it can actually be meaningful to do that, but this is part of the reason that we don't typically recommend it at the end of the study. We tend to recommend it at the beginning of the study because that serves a kind of a, a clear and, and necessary purpose. Thank you, Sam. Um, we have a couple of minutes late. Uh, sorry, left. So hidden one question for you. Um, since some of sometimes the IVPT studies take long to complete, 
And the reference product that is used in the IVRT and Q3 studies, for example, may have expired by the time we get to the IVPT studies. Uh, in that case, can the product used for the IVPT study or the batch of the product used for the IVPT study be different than the product that was used for the Q3 and IVRT? And reference product from those the one that we you characterize the the q3 for i use the same product for sorry same batches for ivrt and ivpt testing now sometimes yeah uh you know in back and forth communication the reference product is is expired uh in my opinion it is okay to use the the different lot of reference product but if you are using the like if for some reason if the taste product is expired uh then and when you man, manufacture a new taste product we do ask for q3 tasting which you have submitted in the original submit uh application for for the newly manufactured batch so i hope that answered the question thank you Helen. um so uh, Again, you can reach out to us through the control for a correspondence or the pre-NDA pathway if you have a specific question about a specific product. However, it is important to establish that bridge uh, if you are submitting data from different batches. Uh, with that, we are at the end of our time. Thank you so much to Dr. Patel for his wonderful presentation, to all of our panelists for joining us today for this last panel session for the day. And now, I would like to take this opportunity to thank all of you for a very exciting and engaging three hours. We received over uh, close to 150 questions and hope we, we got to as many of those as possible. And of course, we always appreciate your questions because that gives us an opportunity to think about them and try to address them in as many venues as possible. Um, with, with that, we would like to close out this meeting by thanking all of our presenters and panelists for the day. We would also like to thank all of our, um, all, all, everybody that made this uh, event possible, including the SBIA staff, including Jeff's team, as well as um, our own team within the Office of Research and Standards who has been, uh, who has been helping with uh, triaging all of the questions in the background. We would also like this opportunity to invite you to a workshop that we plan to host on November 3rd of this year, where we will be develop, uh, discussing efficient scientific-based approaches in development that may be useful for certain prospective genetic products that are compositionally different uh, and may not meet the no significant difference criteria that Sam discussed earlier in his presentation. Uh -huh. With that, thank you so much for attending this webinar today and have a fantastic day.